First, I'd like to thank everyone who's joined us for our educational symposium on experiential learning and STEM education. However, you might be shocked that the opening keynote address is titled, Is There Still a Future in STEM? You might ask yourself, why start with such a critical opening address? But the answer is simple. I truly believe in STEM education. However, even great ideas are prone to failure if they're improperly implemented. Therefore, this keynote isn't about condemning STEM, but about identifying the problems or obstacles that can seriously compromise the development of a quality STEM program. Issues that, if left unchecked, could be detrimental to the continued development of the educational framework that we know of as STEM education. So what I really want to do in today's presentation is to critically assess and evaluate the nature of STEM education so that we can develop rigorous academic programs that uphold the guiding principles that STEM was originally founded upon. To learn from best practices, but also from our own mistakes as well. And that's really the moral of this presentation, what we can do to fix the problem. But before we can fix any problem, we need to take the time to understand it. And with that in mind, I'd like to start by sharing a Chinese proverb. If your plan is for one year, plant rice. If your plan is for 10 years, plant trees. If your plan is for 100 years, educate children. And that's the goal today, to uphold a dream that's almost 70 years in the making, a dream that is shared amongst many nations to educate their children so that they can become more creative, to become critical thinkers, and to pursue a dream that will one day lead their countries towards greatness. So let me start by telling you a true story. Now, it may not seem relevant at first, but I assure you it is, so bear with me for just a moment. I want to start by sharing a story about my sister's path to becoming a successful businesswoman. She graduated summa cum laude in finance and economics from one of the best universities in the country. After graduating, she applied for a job at the national headquarters for the largest fund company in the country. Now, it was not a surprise that she landed the interview, got the job, and started her six-month training program with about 50 other uh, successful candidates. However, she was surprised to find out that she was the only person that was hired with a degree in finance and economics. She asked her hiring manager why the company didn't hire more people with what relevant degrees and qualifications, and their response was that they intentionally avoided it. However, that might come as a big surprise to many of you. Now, what is the moral of the story? Well, the company knew that everything that the candidate had learned was no longer relevant or applicable in the current operational paradigm of the modern financial marketplace. Therefore, they needed to retrain the candidates regardless of what prior learning they already had. In essence, finance and economic graduates learned case studies from past events, analyzed mul multiple hypothetical models, and had the benefit of hindsight when modeling data. Moreover, students had learned about policies and regulations that may no longer be applicable to the current marketplace. And as a result, the students had learned what the students had learned had influenced their decision-making process, and this pre-established conceptual paradigm was often detrimental to the employee's success. Now, what was the cause of this perceptual paradigm? Well, so many graduates had established a paradigm of looking at historical data, analyzing hypothetical alternatives, and analyzing the merits of possible solutions of historical case studies. This resulted in a phenomenon known as paradigm paralysis, a term that was popularized by Joel Baker. In this context, these individuals were so used to looking at historical data in depth and formulating numerous hypothetical solutions that they ended up not being able to act on anything because they were essentially paralyzed by indecision as they tried to explore numerous hypothetical solutions to the same problem. As a result, the company knew that these individuals were typically incapable of effectively evaluating the live data. Now, I'd like you to keep the story in mind because I'm going to return to this idea later in the presentation. So understanding our own thought process, the very theory of knowledge, and how that affects our own understandings and perceptions is an incredibly complex concept. And clinical psychologists will spend their entire careers trying to answer this very question. 
However, without getting into a huge philosophical debate, our perceptions are like our emotions in many ways. We can let our emotions control us, or we can be in control of our own, emo our own emotions. And the same holds true for our perceptions. Now, developing the self-awareness and discipline that's needed to be in control of our own thoughts is incredibly difficult. And we get a glimpse of this in the story that I just shared with you. But this idea also holds true for STEM education as well. Therefore, in a moment, I will continue to illustrate this idea through a series of guided examples that will help us understand the very nature of our own thought process. And I'll also support these examples with proven scientific research. Now, the big idea here is to help us understand the very nature of our own thought process so that we can be in control of our own perceptions. And when that happens, our perceptions will no longer jeopardize the successful development of our STEM programs. Instead, they will become a positive driving factor in the development of quality STEM programs. So if I had to summarize this idea, people who are enslaved by their pre-established perceptions will never question the nature or validity of knowledge. However, those who question the very nature of, of their own assumptions will embark in an inquisitive journey of inquiry and critical thinking. And that's the main idea that we want to develop and model through STEM education. So with that in mind, let's start with big idea number one, understanding our own paradigms. Now, while everyone's coffee is still hot, I'd like to ask you the following question. How many of you like a rich, full-bodied coffee? Now, it sounds quite nice. And if you're going to sit through a long presentation, you probably want a good cup of coffee with you right about now. Now, the reason why I asked you this is because I want to give you a real-life example of a paradigm. In the 1970s, there was a large research study conducted in the Americas that found that most Americans describe themselves as liking a rich, full-body coffee. However, in contrast uh, to what most participants believed, the study found that most Americans liked a weak, watered-down cup of coffee with lots of cream and sugar. So the study revealed something very interesting. People's perceptions of what they think they want are often very different from the actual reality of what they want. And this discrepancy is shaped by our paradigms. Now, telling someone that you like weak, watery uh, coffee with lots of cream and sugar goes against what we believe we should like. Whereas telling someone that you like a rich, full-bodied coffee sounds like what we should say. And most of the time, we're not even aware that we're doing this. It's completely subconscious. And these kinds of disassociative responses are shaped by our paradigms. Now, you may be asking, why is this relevant? Well, what I found in STEM education is that the reality of what people think they want and what they actually want in reality are generally two very different things. And this is particularly true of parents and administrators. And I'll return to this idea later in the presentation. So let me give you some case studies, because this phenomenon is not unique. It happens throughout all aspects of life, from business, education, religion, and politics. But the ideas are completely transferable, and they will help us understand the nature of our own assumptions. And that will help us when we move on to critically analyze our perceptions of STEM education. Now, in the 1970s, Howard Moskowitz was commissioned by Pepsi to develop, to develop the best product. Now, when the data came in, it was scattered beyond belief. There was no bell curve that could be used to indicate what the best product should be. Now, the recommendations that were made by Motzkowitz at the time were as follow. You cannot, and I repeat, you cannot make the best Pepsi. Instead, you need to create a series of Pepsi products that would cater to different market segments, even if they didn't even know what they wanted themselves. Now, this idea was unheard of at the time. So Pepsi rejected the findings because it went against everything their past successes had taught them. It went against their established paradigms. Now, I'd like to fast forward a few years in time. Moskowitz then goes on to take his revelation to Prego, who at the time had limited market share in the United States. Now, in his studies for Prego, Moskowitz experimented with 45 different spaghettis, and he found that people generally fell into three categories. Those who liked a plain spaghetti sauce, those who liked a chunky spaghetti sauce, and those who liked a spicy spaghetti sauce. Again, this research study revealed that most people did not even know what they liked until they were given the opportunity to challenge their own assumptions. And this was because they were caught in a particular paradigm. But what caused this conceptual paradigm in the first place? Well, 
Most people at the time believed that they should like a traditional Italian spaghetti sauce. Because admitting that you liked something that wasn't authentic just didn't sound right. However, the reality of the fact was, most Americans' palate was very different than the average Europeans. So again, we see that people's perceptions are very different from reality, and this discrepancy has been shaped by our paradigms. But before this time, businesses and customers alike were not aware of this phenomenon. As a result, companies were not innovating because they were trapped in this idea of business as usual, and this is how things have always been done. Moreover, customers didn't even know what they liked until they were given an opportunity to explore different product offerings for themselves. And as we saw with Pepsi, they only wanted to look at how to make the best singular Pepsi product, rather than looking at ways to innovate. And why was that? Because the obvious solution was different than their, what they had always done. It went against their established paradigms. And this made them incapable of perceiving the data that was presented to them by Motskovitz. So what was the result of the study? Well, Prego went on to become the most successful spaghetti sauce in the continental United States. And this was because they acted on the research that was presented to them, and they tried something that no one else had ever done before. Now in hindsight, the idea of creating different product offerings to cater to different market segments seems incredibly obvious now. But this was a completely new and novel idea at the time. Now you might ask, what happened to Pepsi? Well, after witnessing the success of Prego, Pepsi made a few changes. In 1977, they hired John Sully. In 1978, they started experimenting with new flavors. And in 1980, Pepsi went on to capture the number one spot in sales. So it took a while to recognize and understand their mistake. After all, they were unable to cap, uh, conceptualize the recommendations that were made to them many years earlier, because the data didn't fit into their perceptual paradigm of how a business should be run. Now you might be asking yourself, how is this related to STEM education? As these examples illustrate, most people's perceptions of what they think they want and what they actually want are two very different disassociated concepts. And this holds true to our perceptions of STEM education as well. Our entire perception of STEM is shaped by our paradigms. And as we've seen, paradigms can blind us from the truth. Furthermore, as we have very different pre-established paradigms, this makes it very difficult for us to develop a common language to understand STEM education. As a result, we often see that there's a lot of confusion surrounding STEM. And that is one thing that I hope to alleviate by the end of this presentation. Therefore, to address this issue, we need to develop some common language and understandings of STEM education before moving on. But let's talk about what a paradigm is, because I've been using this word a lot. Now, according to the dictionary, a paradigm is a pattern or a model. And this does, definition doesn't really give us a lot of information. But according to Joel Baker, paradigms essentially establish boundaries, which is what a pattern does. They also go on to tell us how to be successful within the boundaries of a given model. Now, with this in mind, I'd also like to uh, quickly review a research study that was conducted by Thomas Kuhn, who researched the effects of paradigms in science. Now, Kuhn made an interesting discovery. In essence, he found that paradigms acted as filters that screened information from the scientist's mind. Information that supported the scientist's perceptions was easily accepted, while information that conflicted with the scientist's per perceptions was often ignored. And why was this? Because the data did not match the individual's pre-established paradigms. Now, sometimes the data would be ignored. Sometimes it was manipulated to fit within the, what was expected, and sometimes, and I quote, the scientists were physiologically incapable of perceiving the unexpected data. And we saw this with Pepsi. They were unable to accept the data that was presented to them because it went against their paradigms. Essentially, the board of directors was psychologically in, or physiologically incapable of accepting the new data, analyzing it, and drawing conclusions for themselves because the data that they were presented with did not fit into their pre-existing conceptual paradigm. And this happens with STEM education as well. Our paradigms often prevent us from taking a moment to analyze and evaluate our own assumptions. And as a result, we become trapped within the established boundaries of our paradigm. We never question the nature of our own thought. And this is an important idea for us to consider as teachers, as we need to question the nature of our own knowledge. But more importantly, we need to move beyond a rudimentary understanding of STEM education 
so that we can develop a deeper understanding of the true nature of STEM education by questioning our own assumptions, by challenging our pre-established paradigms. And that brings us to big idea number two, where I'd like to develop a shared paradigm of STEM education with you. Now, so far I've warned you about the dangers of paradigms, and now I'm saying that we need to develop a shared paradigm. But what we want to do here is to develop a shared understanding of STEM education in which we can use to develop our discussions. But more importantly, we want to build a common framework in which we can use to critically reflect upon and analyze our own assumptions. And I want to emphasize those key words again, critically reflect and analyze our own assumptions. After all, in the previous examples, we've seen the dangers that pre-established paradigms can have when people allow their perceptions to control their own thought process. Therefore, we need to develop a culture of, of lifelong learning that will foster inquiry and critical thinking so that we're constantly questioning the very nature of our own assumptions to challenge and uh, validate the integrity of our perceptions. And that's the reason why we want to develop a common perceptual paradigm of STEM education. It isn't to tell you what to think, but to help you think about how you think. Therefore, we want to develop a paradigm of critical thinking and analysis, and not a paradigm of ignorance, complacency, and blind acceptance. So let's talk about STEM. But more importantly, what is STEM education? Now, to answer this question, we need to review our own history. We need to understand where STEM came from and why it's important in the first place. Now, the space race of the 1950s and 60s essentially united the country behind a common goal. And this led to the development of Excellent Vocational and Technological Education Programs, or VTE for short, in the, the 1970s and 80s. Now, this time frame also marked the height of corporate R&D in the United States as well, until 1997 when the share of uh, business research started to decline. This was also coupled by the fact that many teachers who were part of this initial wave of educational innovation were also approaching retirement age. Now the VTE programs did continue well into the 90s when they reached their zenith before starting to decline. And this was also about the same time that corporate uh, research in the United States also started to decline as well. Now these two issues are completely unrelated to one another, but they will have a compounding effect on the US economy, innovation, and education. And as a result, the economy and many VTE programs uh, peaked in the late 1990s. So by the late 1990s, many VTE programs that schools offered were starting to stagnate. Teachers were approaching retirement age and businesses were not conducting as much R&D as they had done in previous decades. And all these factors would put into motion a series of events that would have a profound effect on the US economy and subsequently education. By the turn of the century, multiple government reports were indicating that the United States was falling further behind in sectors that were critical to the economy. Now, not to state the obvious, but the fact that students in the U.S. were trailing in these sectors was bad. And this really illustrates the idea that the goal with STEM education was to ensure that the nation would continue to be a global leader in innovation. So it really comes down to the need of any country to protect its own uh, economic interests and more importantly, to protect its own national sovereignty. Therefore, in 2001, Judith Ramley formally introduced the acronym that we know today. 
Now, I would argue that STEM was really just an extension of the VTE programs of the 1970s through 1990s. However, there was one big difference. Vocational programs ranged in nature. Some were aligned to the development of job skills for a general labor market, while others were geared towards critical sectors in the economy such as civil, computer, and electrical engineering. As such, STEM was not all-encompassing of the VTE program offerings. Instead, it took the best of what those programs had to offer. And when I say the best, I mean the attainment of rigorous academic learning outcomes and standards. As a result, aspects of project-based learning were popularized and brought to mainstream education. However, by 2005, another report came out which revealed that students in the United States were still falling further behind other nations, and this wasn't what we wanted to see. Now, only four years had passed since STEM was introduced, and that's not enough time to see the effects of a long-term strategic policy. However, people are often very impatient, and they started criticizing the STEM framework because it wasn't producing results. More specifically, it wasn't producing results as fast as what they wanted. Then, in 2008, Georgette Yakman introduced a STEM derivative that she called STEAM to address a number of perceived shortcomings in STEM education. And I really want to reiterate this notion of perceived shortcomings with STEM. So let's, look, let's take a look at what's wrong with STEM. However, STEM means something very different to various stakeholder groups. For instance, STEM means one thing to governments, particularly as they look at ways to develop a stronger economy, but also as a tool to protect their own national sovereignty. It means something different to industry professionals in strategic sectors that are critical to the economy. Again, it means something diff uh, very different to school administrators who look at it as a way of boosting student engagement and increasing school enrollment. And this is particularly true of private or international schools, which are not publicly funded and to K-12 educators who look at STEM as an educational framework. And it also means something very different to corporations, who look at it as a market opportunity with some of the best financial returns in the industry. Therefore, we come to one of the more recent problems with STEM education, which is the monopolization of STEM education for financial and not educational gains. And this is creating an unsustainable educational model that if left unchecked could seriously impact the future of STEM education. Now you might think that I'm going to say that corporations are evil, or you might already feel that way after seeing your school's budgets eroded by expensive educational products. But that's not the point that I'm trying to make. These corporations only responded to a need within the educational sector, a need that we ourselves have created. And this is in part because teachers were asked to do something without being given the proper support or resources that they needed to implement such a grand vision. Therefore, the problems that we face today were created collectively by our society at large. But regardless of how we got here, we need to start looking at ways to solve these problems together. Now, it's widely accepted that the acronym uh, for STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. And I don't think anyone would argue with that. It seems that everybody knows what STEM is. But most people don't seem to understand what STEM is based on how much confusion there is surrounding STEM and all of its derivatives. So let me delve into this idea. Now I think most people are aware of Bloom's taxonomy, but if you don't, Bloom's taxonomy is the classification of different levels of thinking or cognition. This is where knowledge is placed at the bottom, and as we develop our understandings, we can start applying what we know and eventually synthesize and evaluate the results of our own thought process. And I think that this is an important idea for us to stop and think about. Everybody has knowledge of what STEM is, but very few people have a deeper understanding of the true nature of STEM education or what it should be. And we as educators know there's a big difference between knowledge and understanding. Therefore, we need to move beyond a rudimentary knowledge of what STEM is and challenge our own assumptions. But before we do that, let's look at some of the criticisms that have been made of the STEM framework. Meanwhile, Roos believes that we should promote a new structure that also includes the arts and humanities, stating that it's through STEM plus MA progress that we have the chance to become practically wise. Furthermore, Fung goes on to criticize the superficial nature of STEM, STEM education, indicating that STEM education is only concerned about the project itself, while ignoring the concern for the person. 
And this criticism also explains why China has adopted its own interpretation, which they refer to as STEM plus Yu, which essentially means STEM plus quality moral education. Even the World Economic Forum has called for reforms in STEM education, indicating we should also expand the scope of STEM education to ensure that students learn to evaluate and respond to the social, economic, and political consequences of their work. Now, all of these examples illustrate some very critical views on STEM education and present a very grim outlook for the future of STEM. So much so that these criticisms might lead you to think that there is no future in STEM education. But I don't believe that. Now, while these criticisms are valid, they didn't solve the problem. Instead, numerous STEM derivatives were created to solve a problem without understanding what caused the problem in the first place. And this has led to an incredibly confusing landscape for educators and administrators alike. But the worst part is, because of all these STEM derivatives, there's no longer any common language or perceptions of what STEM is anymore. And that has made the problem even worse. So let's take a look at some of the pro popular acronyms. We have STEM, and we also have STEAM, which adds creativity through the arts. And I think everybody already knows of these two acronyms. We have STEMS, which recognizes the importance of social sciences by adding the S at the end of the acronym. STEMA, which adds managerial arts and was first proposed by Harvard University. Next, we have ESTEAM, which recognizes the importance of developing English literacy skills. And this is an important concept that's um, further substantiated by research that was conducted by Tran, who indicated that countries with higher English proficiency levels are more innovative as they have access to a wider breadth of current research material from the global community. Therefore, this idea of including an ESL curriculum um, into STEM education is an important concept that will help students in non-English speaking countries develop the skills that they need to access a wider range of research materials. And this leads us to another derivative known as STREAM, which adds reading and research to the STEM framework. And finally, we have STEM with a double M, which was created by Dr. Stephen Meyer and Reverend John Gretz, who added the values of Christian missionary to the mandates of STEM education. And this ties in with the idea that the World Economic Forum had, but from a slightly religious standpoint. It also corresponds well to the idea that the Chinese had by combining STEM with Yu or quality moral education. Now, I would like to argue that these criticisms of STEM are not actually directed at the educational pedagogy of STEM itself, but address evident shortcomings or failings of poorly designed projects or curricula. So let me summarize everything here for, um, for you in just a, a quick moment. All these comments indicated a lack of creativity a lack of meaningful connections with the human or social aspects of what we do or why we do it, and that STEM places too much emphasis on the act of doing instead of reaching the desired learning outcomes. But if we look at careers in STEM, which we'll do in just a moment, you'll see that all these shortcomings are critical aspects of what these professionals do on a daily basis. And for that reason, I believe that all of these criticisms of STEM are actually invalid because all these criticisms address ad shortcomings in the development of STEM projects or curricula, which are either inadequate, inappropriate, or completely misrepresent the true nature of STEM education. And that is why I've chosen to continue to use the word STEM instead of STEAM or any other derivative that might be trendy in the current marketplace. Because at the end of the day, the development of these derivatives has only served to further complicate matters while also adding uncertainty and confusion to our understanding of STEM education. Moreover, this has distracted us from solving the problem at hand, which is understanding the true nature of STEM education and ensuring that what we're doing in the classroom, such as designing projects and curricula, do in fact support the desired learning outcomes. So let's start thinking about what STEM is and really develop upon our conceptual paradigm of STEM, because with all the confusion surrounding STEM, we may not actually have a deep enough understanding to be able to properly define the true nature of STEM education, but more importantly, we need a clear and concise definition of STEM that we can use to evaluate and assess our own teaching practices. Now, I really like this definition of STEM because it upholds the original ideas for STEM education that were introduced back in 2001. So let's read through this definition together. STEM education is an interdisciplinary approach to learning where rigorous academic concepts are coupled with real world lessons as students apply science, technology, engineering, and mathematics in contexts that make connections between school, community, work, and the global enterprise 
enabling the development of STEM literacies and with it the ability to compete in the new economy. Wow, this definition is very verbose, and it's hard to unpack because it's so dense. So I'm going to highlight a few key words here. Interdisciplinary approach, rigorous academic concepts, real world lessons, apply science, technology, engineering, and mathematics in context to compete in the new economy. Now, as I've already mentioned, STEM is linked to economic growth and national sovereignty. And we can't forget about this connection because this is really the main driving force at the government level for STEM education. However, this definition, great as it is, is hard to take in all at once. Therefore, let's try simplifying this definition before moving on. STEM solves real world problems using science, technology, engineering, mathematics. This is the simplest definition that I can make to define STEM, and I've never had anyone object to this definition. However, as I mentioned earlier, paradigms establish boundaries, and these boundaries shape our perceptions. Now, conceptual paradigms are not inherently bad, unless they limit our ability to see the obvious, and that is what we need to do right now. Currently, our paradigm, which I've represented by a red box, is incredibly small, and this is going to limit our understanding of STEM. Therefore, we need to add a bit more depth. So let's expand on our understanding of STEM education. If our aim is to solve real world problems, then the problems that we explore should be authentic. By extension, the solutions to those problems should be also be authentic. And finally, the approach should also be cross curricular. So let's look at some careers in STEM. We have the fields of architecture, biology, computing, engineering, the medical sciences, and horticulture, just to name a few. I should also indicate that although there's thousands of careers in STEM, I'm only to able to showcase a select few. Now, at first glance, these fields all look completely different, and you might say that there's no common link between any of them. And it never even occurs to most people to even look for a common link between unrelated careers. But this link is crucial for us to develop a deeper understanding of what STEM is. Now, if the relationship is not evident to you, don't worry. It's not something that would be naturally intuitive. So let me start by showing you Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Now, you might not see the connection yet, but let me start with the architect. Simply put, an architect designs buildings, but if we delve a bit deeper, we can see that they create a wide array of structures. These structures include homes, schools, and hospitals. But no, how, no matter how simple or complex these structures are, they all provide us with shelter, which is one of our most fundamental human needs. And these are not needs that are isolated. Everyone in society needs shelter, access to education and healthcare, and places to connect. Therefore, architects serve a societal need. Next, the various fields of biology, and this one I think is very germane in our society right now, particularly during COVID, um, as researchers and biochemists alike were required to sequence viral mutations, creating vaccines and therapeutic drugs. Meanwhile, biomedical engineers were creating ventilators and other protective equipment to end the pandemic. Therefore, individuals in these fields of study were also real, were solving real-world problems that addressed a legitimate need in our society. And what about the field of computing? Well, while some programmers do make things like games, many are engaged in the development of, of and maintenance of programs that keep our societies running. Programmers create traffic control systems that change the lights at intersections, the power management systems that control the national grid, and even the software that controls that life support system in the hospital. Moreover, hardware engineers develop new and innovative solutions that make all of these things possible. So again, these professionals are solving real world problems that address ne the needs of society. And I think at this point, engineering and medical science would be self-explanatory as these professionals help to create and maintain a healthy and functional society. So I'm gonna jump to the last one, which is horticulture. In this example, I'd like to introduce you to Yuan Longping, who is well known as the man who ended hunger. His research into hybrid rice strains saved millions of lives during the Great Famine and is now feeding nearly one-fifth of the world's population with less than 9% of the world's total landmass. And this is a prime example of what experts in various STEM fields do for a living, 
They solve real world problems that address a legitimate need in our society. And I think that that's another important qualifier that we need to add to our definition of STEM education. Careers in STEM address real needs in our societies and not individual wants or desires. So I'd like you to look at these two photographs for a moment and decide if both of these would represent a, a career in STEM. Think about it for a moment. After all, both individuals are working in the field of horticulture. Now, what evidence can you provide to support your argument? Now, I'm assuming everyone said that the farmer did not represent a career in STEM, but when I put these photos side by side, it doesn't seem clear anymore. Why does one of these careers represent a, a career in STEM while the other doesn't? And it's these kinds of murky situations that really impact our understandings of STEM education, especially when we don't have a conceptual paradigm that's deep enough to evaluate the true nature of STEM education. Now, the farmer on the right is helping to serve a real need in our society. They use a vast array of agricultural technologies to do their jobs. They apply different chemical or organic methods to improve crop yield, and they design irrigation systems to tend to their crops. So wouldn't this be a career in STEM? After all, it meets so many of our criteria that we've come up with. So let's look at this again. Yuan Lamping was an innovator who led change. He didn't grow all the rice that ended the famine. Instead, he created a new strain of rice which others could grow. The farmer, on the other hand, represents either skilled or unskilled labor. They are not leading change or innovation. And this is a key distinction that we need to make. STEM is about leading innovation and not about the development of a general labor market. So what about any of these professional careers? Many people generally associate STEM with hands-on learning and skill development. So highly skilled or professional looking jobs are often considered to be a career in STEM. And this often influences our choice as educators when we are planning our curriculum and making classroom activities. Let's take the chef for instance. Is this st uh, STEM? And what evidence do we have to support that argument? Well, we all need to eat. But as we saw with the example of the farmer, a chef is catering to individual wants or desires, not a legitimate need that addresses a societal issue. And for this reason alone, being a chef is not a career in STEM. Next, the sales clerk. And this could be selling insurance or any number of luxury items such as designer clothing to sports cars. But again, these professionals are catering to individual desires and not societal needs. But what about the contractor? They're dealing with structural engineering, electrical sy systems, plumbing, and so much more. So if the architect and civil engineer are considered careers in STEM, shouldn't being a contractor be considered a career in STEM as well? Well, while the contractor has a working knowledge of engineering, they're the skilled labor or the skilled workforce that executes the vision of the architects or the engineers. They're not the ones driving the innovation in the first place. So again, we see the separation between innovation and sk skilled labor, which needs to be a factor in our understanding of the true nature of STEM education. So at this point, we should have a very clear definition of STEM education, which is much easier for everyone to understand. And we also have enough depth to be able to critically analyze and evaluate our own educational practices. So let's quickly review what we've covered so far. STEM solves real world problems using science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and should explore authentic problems by developing authentic solutions using a cross-curricular approach while addressing legitimate needs in our society and should lead innovation through creative problem solving. But I should also emphasize that although numerous hands-on skills are learned in STEM, the focus of STEM education is not about developing skills for a general labor market, but should be about leading innovation. So if we go back uh, and review all the criticisms that have been made of STEM, we can see that these arguments are invalid based on our current framework. Let's quickly review each one of them at one at a time. STEM lacks creativity. STEM l omits the humanities. STEM lacks management skills. STEM only focuses on the project itself. STEM does not respond to social or economic consequences. As we've seen, STEM is all about creative problem solving and often requires us to look at a problem from a different perspective. Therefore, STEM does involve creativity and critical thinking. STEM is in fact centered around the humanities, and as we can see by the focus of solving real world problems, that these are actually centered around societal needs, and our curriculum design in STEM should be also mimic this as well. 
The fact that STEM lacks management skills is also a misnomer, as STEM is all about leading innovation. And this requires students to learn about project management, collaboration, while also developing communication skills as well. So we see that STEM should cover these skills if it's being done properly. Next, the fact that there's a growing number of people saying that STEM only focuses on the project uh, is a very concerning trend. And part of this is because of the number of do-it-yourself kits that are being sold under the guise of STEM education. Now there's nothing wrong with do-it-yourself kits or the companies that sell them, but these do-it-yourself kits often do not uphold the ideology of STEM education. However, the use of these kits is growing exponentially, and this is being driven by the amount of confusion surrounding STEM education and a lack of support being given to educators who've been thrown into a program without any training or support. And finally, that STEM does not consider the social impacts of innovation. Again, the statement is completely inaccurate. Look at the development of hybrid rice trains by Yuan Longping, or the study of renewable energy. Look at the development of all the technologies that we use in everyday life, which helps to improve our lives. And then think about how all of these innovations have impacted the social and economic well-being of our society. Therefore, all of these criticisms are invalid, and that's why I've decided to continue to use the STEM acronym. Because at the end of the day, there's nothing wrong with STEM education if it's done properly. And that brings us to big idea number three. At this point, I'd like to provide you with some classroom examples to apply our current understanding of STEM education with. As we saw with the original definition for STEM education, the goal is to create real-world lessons that apply science, technology, engineering, and mathematics in an authentic context. And this is an important idea because it helps show our students the reasons why they're learning these concepts in the first place, which provides clarity as the students can then understand the value of what they're learning, visualize their future career paths, and begin to imagine the type of lifelong learning that's going to be associated with that journey. But in order for us to make this that kind of impact, we need to make sure that the learning opportunities that we offer our students are meaningful, authentic, and academically stimulating. Therefore, we need to ensure that our projects uphold rigorous academic standards that will help prepare our students for the new global economy. So building on this idea, we'll review several STEM projects, evaluate them based on grade level expectations, and then we'll look at ways to ensure that we're either achieving or exceeding the desired learning outcomes. Here are several projects from a grade 11 program that I worked with a few years ago. Now, if our goal is to create rigorous academic programs that will foster innovation in key economic sectors, and this is what we're doing in a grade 11 project, then we have a serious problem, and the school thought so as well. Therefore, I started going through these projects, and I did see some potential in some of them, so let's focus on this drone project in a little bit more detail. I decided to redesign this project, but this approach of using a 3D doodle pen, that had to go. With the original project design, there was no math, there was no science, and there was no real use of technology either. Everything was just focused on the act of making a drone. It was completely reactive in nature, where STEM should apply en the engineering and design process, which is a well-planned and methodical approach to design. Therefore, after redesigning the projects, we started with this. Here you can see the students are using specialized equipment such as calipers to take specific and precise measurements. They then went on to make a rough draft of their design using pencil and paper before reviewing it, critiquing it, and then revising it. Finally, the students digitized their designs using a CAD program so that they could print their designs using a 3D printer. Now you might say that this looks great, but as I mentioned before, STEM should solve real-world problems. So you might ask, how does this drone project address a legitimate need in our society? Well, not that long ago, we had a major flood in Henan province, and China had a very interesting solution to the pro uh, problem. It was an automated drone that could be deployed to restore 5G cell ser service over a 50 square kilometer area for up to five hours. And this one drone was able to help rescue crews find, locate, and save thousands of people in the aftermath of the flood. So the idea of drone development does, in fact, solve a real-world problem. So although the initial project design was poorly executed, there was value in the idea. The teacher just needed help to refine that idea and to develop the project in a, bit more, in a more meaningful way. As such, after redesigning the project, students were shown how, uh, shown how to apply the engineering and design process in an authentic way while also using specialized equipment such as calipers to take precise measurements which they would use when creating their drones. 
They created designs on paper, analyzed their ideas with their peers in a formal critique process, and revised their designs before digitizing these designs using a CAD program so that they could use technologies such as 3D printers in an authentic way to support the desired outcomes. And finally, they created a high-quality product that upholds the ideals of STEM education. Now here's a quick video of a, uh, of a student's final project. While it did use pre-made circuits, the drone itself was created by the students. Now what about this STEM project? What grade level do you think this was for? What about now? This was a grade 12 honors chemistry project where the students were learning about water resistant paints. Now you might be thinking, just as I am right now, that this activity isn't appropriate for that grade level. But the school was proud of the results because they thought it, this was a good example of STEM education because the students had engaged in project based learning. Now here we have some more images from that post. And you can see that these grade 12 students are in a well-equipped chemistry lab uh, creating paints using craft glue and colored chalk. But we're probably asking ourselves, where is the real chemistry? And that brings us uh, to the idea of throwing teachers into a STEM program without any training or support. After all, designing authentic STEM lessons is incredibly difficult, especially if teachers have never worked in industry before. Now, I should state that this teacher was amazing at teaching chemistry when it came to teaching theoretical concepts, that is. However, they had a limited understanding of how to apply science to solve in, uh, industrial problems in the real world. Now, there's so many ways that we could have made this project a little bit better and how we could improve it. So here I have some examples of what we could have done instead. To the left, I have reference to a chemical compound that would allow for a thermo therm thermochromatic effect to be explored. That is, when the color of something changes color due to temperatures as a reverse result of a reversible chemical reaction. Next, on the right, I have an example of how you can create ferric oxide to create a color pigment. Now for reference, ferric oxide is used to create cosmetic products such as blush. So we already have a few options that we could use to uh, improve this one project. But let's take this a little bit further. Now that we have some pigments, we can then explore different chemical methods to convert these pigments into paint. First, we could look at how to use different chemical solutions to create a binding agent. Second, we could look at our past to learn how some of the greatest minds of our time created masterpieces such as the 16th Chapel. At this time, paints were made using pigments such as ferric oxide and lapis lazuli, which were ground up into fine powders. These pigments were then mixed with egg whites to create a molecularly stable organic compound that could last for centuries. And in all honesty, these methods are actually superior to our current manufacturing processes in many ways. So this project could be easily be redesigned in a way that would make it much more meaningful. Now what about this project? Again, it's another social media post, this time for a grade 12 calculus project. Now the post indicated that the students were exploring the velocity of marble using calculus, but realistically the math and the project are somewhat disassociated from one another. You don't really need the, pro the math to do the project and you don't need the project to do the math. Therefore, these two aspects of the project are loosely correlated. So is this really STEM? And I've also seen this the same roller coaster project being used at very different age levels, specifically in senior level calculus classes and in grade two art classes, which raises some serious questions. Are we developing projects that are age appropriate? And it's this kind of disconnect between the desired learning outcomes and the project design, which is causing a lot of problems within STEM education. Now here we have a website promoting this activity, and I'm not disputing the quality of the website, the resource, or the validity of the project itself, but I do want to draw your attention to something here in the corner. It indicates arts and crafts, hands-on fun, and that's how this project is being described. But when we look at the driving forces behind STEM, it's about ensuring continued innovation uh, in the strategic sectors that were critical to the economy. Therefore, I will reiterate that STEM was created to ensure continued economic prosperity of the nation, which in turn plays a pivotal role in protecting our national sovereignty. It was never to create hands-on activities for students to have fun in class. So how did we get here? How did we get deviate so far from our primary objective? Just look at these books, STEAM creations, and book-inspired STEAM activities for kids. And again, I'm not criticizing the book or the author, 
but I do want you to look at some of these examples of what people are starting to call STEM or STEAM education. But if you look here, it says craft brain. All these books and activities are representative of arts and crafts and not STEM. Now, STEAM was supposed So how did we get here? How did we reduce rigorous academic programs to nothing more than glorified art projects? To understand how we got here, we need to understand a number of cause and effect relationships that are happening in our society. We need to understand our own history. As I've already mentioned, the space race of the 1950s and 60s acted as a catalyst that galvanized all aspects of our society, specifically in America. And it ushered in an era of unprecedented collaboration between governments and industry uh, and the educational sector as well, which led to the development of high quality VT programs in the 1970s, 80s and 90s. However, by the late 1990s, many of the educators that were part of this golden age of collaboration were approaching retirement age, and this in turn led to the stagnation of these programs. Moreover, by the year 2000, it was evident that innovation was slowing and that the economy was lagging in key sectors. Therefore, STEM was introduced to solve uh, issues of student proficiency in these key areas. However, a critical issue was overlooked. The root cause of these problems was never identified. We were quick to determine that student proficiency was trailing in key sectors to the economy, but we never stopped to ask why this was happening. So let me explain. The late 1990s onwards saw a lot of experienced teachers leave the profession due to retirement. Meanwhile, the introduction of STEM education in 2001 created huge demand for qualified teachers, and this shortage was only exacerbated by the effects of numerous teachers simultaneously leaving the profession. Moreover, while demand outpaced supply, um, appropriate actions were not taken to address the issues of teacher shortages in these key sectors. As a result, new teachers were often asked to teach STEM with little training or support. And as we saw in the report rising above the gathering storm, we didn't achieve our initial goals with the development of STEM education, and the situation only got worse with time, and that led to the development of numerous STEM derivatives. However, as we're starting to see, these derivatives such as STEAM didn't address the root cause of the problem. In reality, they only served to further complicate matter. To summarize, STEM was introduced to address a massive need in our society, and we see this burden being placed on teachers by local governments. However, teachers know all too well. They're seldomly given the support, guidance, or resources that they need to fulfill these kinds of requests. Moreover, unlike what we saw happen in the 1950s and 60s, our current situation does not have a galvanizing catalyst to help foster collaboration between these three sectors, government, industry, and education. As a result, anything that involved hands-on approaches to teaching and learning started getting branded as STEM education. And this perpetuated a simplistic or superficial understanding of STEM education to hold, take hold. Furthermore, as the result of, result of confusion surrounding the development of STEM education, corporations started capitalizing on the business opportunities that were growing in the educational sector. And while some companies created completely new educational resources, other companies simply rebranded existing products to capitalize on a market that was ripe for the taking. And that brings me to my next topic. Now, as we've already seen, STEM was introduced to spur innovation by having students develop rigorous academic concepts prior to attending specialized university programs, and this would better prepare students for an increasingly competitive global economy. Moreover, this would also help to strengthen and improve the economy at the same time. However, in order for this to happen, the educational sector would need to develop curricula that could apply complex concepts in an authentic way, while also developing a sustainable educational model. And the only way to do this properly is to identify the desired learning outcomes and then design a program of study around transferable concepts that can transcend the test of time. However, the rush to develop programs has often resulted in technology purchases being made in haste, 
and this results in the learning outcomes being shaped around how to use a specific piece of technology instead of the authentic use of that technology. As such, the advent of STEM education saw thousands of products come to market. However, many of these products focus solely on the act of making a project and often fail to address key learning outcomes in the process. And as we saw earlier, this was a large contributing factor that led to many of the criticisms against STEM in the first place. Therefore, if we want to prepare students for the world of tomorrow, we need to act today. We need to focus on developing authentic programs of study that are designed around sound educational practices. And to illustrate this point, I'm going to show you some examples of STEM programs from 30 years ago to illustrate that quality curriculum development can withstand the test of time. Therefore, if we look past the fads, we can develop sustainable pro programs of study that are fiscally responsible as they maximize the life cycle of the equipment that is needed to run the program, which increases the return on investment while simultaneously developing a more sustainable curriculum that targets the most rigorous academic standards. With that said, I want to talk about the idea of fads for enduring knowledge. Here we have a school that's showcasing one of their new STEM products, a race car track for CO2 dragsters, and this is a project that I personally really like. It's also one of the best-selling project kits from companies such as High Genius and Pitsco. Now, while some STEM products have only been around for a few years, this one product has been sold in the United States for close to 70 years now. For example, here's the Pitsco Guide to Education from 1990 that I used uh, as a student. But CO2 racers were popular much earlier than that. In these final examples from the mid-1950s, you can see that these do-it-yourself kits became popular in the United States during the U.S.-Soviet space race as they inspired young Americans to get interested in aerodynamics and propulsion. Now, although this was a little bit before my time, my father's generation would build these rocket-propelled cars and race them in large tournaments, some of which were even held at the national level. Now, we can see the influence of rocket-propelled vehicles as a major driving force in our society today. From the development of the fastest land-based vehicle, which was essentially a rocket on wheels, to our modern-day maglev technologies, all these advancements came from the study of propulsion and aerodynamics. Therefore, the idea of rocket propulsion and aerodynamics are ideas that can transcend the test of time. And although some of the methods that we use will vary over time, the core learning objectives, that is the curriculum at the heart of the project, that has remained the same. And I think that this is an important thing to consider when developing sustainable STEM programs. We need to look at the desired learning outcomes and be careful not to be distracted by new fads or technology. So with that in mind, I want to show you some examples of what our technology programs looked like in the 1990s just to illustrate this point. Here we have an example of this project back in 1993. Again, this is before STEM even existed. But you can really see the cross-curricular nature, nature that these programs um, had back then. Not only did the students design, build, and test their racers, they also dealt with the logistics of setting up the tournaments, broadcasting, and providing live commentary of the, co the event as well. Now fast forward 30 years. I wanted to start a broadcasting program post-COVID to help parents be part of their child's school community again. Therefore, I pulled out all of my old camera equipment out of storage. Now, most of this equipment was purchased in 2002 when I started my first company, so this isn't state-of-the-art equipment. However, all the schools, uh, high-end private schools that attended this tournament were amazed at how sophisticated the setup was. Everyone commented that they had never seen anything like this before, and that shocked me. Think about it. How did we digress so far? And why is it that I'm constantly looking to our past to find inspiration for our future, particularly in the fast-moving fields of science and technology? But that's not the only example that I can give you. So I want to take you back to another class project from the mid-1990s. This was an amazing aviation project that my teacher, John Perkins, designed in collaboration with an aerospace engineer. Now we spent the entire term learning the math and science of aviation, manufacturing techniques, electronic control systems, and much more. And at the end of the day, we had built a scale model that we flew out of the local airport. And this is a great example of what an interdisciplinary approach to real-world lessons which offers rigorous academic concepts would look like. Moreover, I think that this is what the government was looking for when Judith Ramley introduced STEM back in 2001. So when I started developing aviation projects for STEM programs here in China, I did exactly what John did almost 30 years earlier. 
I reached out to industry professionals and started working with an aerospace engineer from the Nanjing University of Aeronautics and Astronomics. And this really helped me as a teacher, as it helped me design scaffolded lessons and projects that would make introducing aviation into a high school program a viable reality. But we don't see this kind of collaboration happening anymore between governments, industry professionals, and teachers anymore. And this has really been to the detriment of STEM education. Now, as I've mentioned before, STEM should uh, solve real-world problems. So you might be thinking, how does the study of aviation address a real-world problem? Well, recently I came across this news story on CNN which illustrates this idea perfectly. Johan wanted to know if his life choices were having a positive effect on addressing climate change, so he contacted CNN for help. Now, Johan has a very healthy lifestyle. He eats mostly vegetables, rides his bike everywhere, and has installed solar panels on his roof. Now, based on all these factors, his carbon footprint is about 40% less than the average American. However, there's one choice that makes that makes and negates all his other lifestyle choices. Every year, Johan returns to the Netherlands to visit his family. As we can see in this example, all the choices that he has made as an individual were dwarfed in comparison by the one thing that was out of his control, the emissions from commercial aviation. And so this idea of researching aerodynamics has and will continue to be important for years to come. And that leads me to my next example. While well, do-it-yourself kits provide educators with easy, ready-made projects that can be implemented with little to no preparation, these kits tend to offer very little towards achieving the desired learning outcomes of established curricula. However, Rocketry has so many wonderful grade-level extensions for senior school students. Drawing inspiration from my own experience from the 1990s, I can speak to the scientific value that model rockets can have. Take this for example. Here's a balanced chemical reaction for a combustion-based reaction. Now, if you're not overly familiar with chemistry, let me explain what's happening. First, we have potassium nitrate, or fertilizer, and this is mixed with regular table sugar. If this chemical mixture does not encounter a flame, it's relatively stable. However, it's capable of creating a powerful combustion-based chemical reaction that will create a large amount of thrust. During combustion, this chemical reaction will result in the formation of an inorganic salt, carbon dioxide, and water. Now, as an instructor, I wouldn't give my students the balanced chemical equation. Instead, I would start by reviewing how to balance a chemical equation, and then have my students balance this equation on their own before checking their work and moving on. Then, in order to create the most efficient rocket fuel, students would need to determine the molar mass of each compound so that they can determine the correct ratio of each. With the math completed, they would then be ready to create their own rocket fuel. Now, as it stands, this project would have them apply chemistry in an authentic way. However, it still wouldn't have the students apply the scientific method. And I have a perfect way of addressing that problem. I would like to, you to think about what would happen if we added aluminum to the mix. Would it improve your rocket's performance? And what evidence could you use to support your claim? In this example, students would need to formulate a hypothesis that we could then go on and test. Now, in theory, Adding something that's not necessary to balance the chemical reaction isn't recommended. However, adding aluminum to rocket fuel is the exception to that rule. Let me tell you a little bit more about this phenomenon. In the early 1950s, uh, Kenneth Rumble and Charles Henderson conducted a series of experiments where they added aluminum to conventional rocket fuels. The result of their experiments indicated a dramatic increase in the exit velocity of the combustion gases so much so that this brought solid fuel rockets into similar performance levels as liquid fuels such as kerosene and liquid oxygen. Due to the research into chemical propulsion methods, the US Navy was able to significantly increase the range of ballistic missiles and suborbital rockets. Now, because this was a bit of a trick scenario, almost every student's hypothesis will be disproven by the experiment. However, this will give them a great opportunity to conduct some internet research. And students should be able to find the answers to this question as the initial research has been declassified and can be found easily on the internet. But what about testing such a hypothesis? Well, in the 1990s, we had to use analog test equipment. However, now we can use digital force meters, which opens up a world of possibilities. Now we can easily record and export precise data from our experiments directly to the computer which makes it even easier to do this kind of experiment now than it was 30 years ago. And here you can see what a simple setup for testing homemade rocket engines would look like in this photo. 
And finally, if your school has a metal shop, which mine did, you can even manufacture your own rocket engines using a small metal lathe. Therefore, you can see in these examples, when you develop a fully cross-curricular approach to teaching and learning, your projects will last longer, and this will lower your hourly cost of instruction. Moreover, each project will explore the core curriculum in far more depth. And this type of in-depth inquiry-based exploration, that's what's going to make students more competitive in the global economy. Now, without a galvanizing force to bring governments, industry, and educational sectors together, teachers have essentially been asked to do the impossible. And that's where corporations came to the rescue. Teachers were crying out for support, resources, and materials. And companies were all too happy to provide products to fill this need. But that also gave them an opportunity to start directing the narrative as well, which would give them the power to monopolize on what was unfolding in the educational sector. But I would like to build on this idea a bit more before moving on. Earlier in the presentation, I discussed that different stakeholder groups had different understandings of what STEM education meant to them, and that these ideas had diverged over time. And although it seems unrelated, geopolitics is having a pronounced impact on the global state of STEM education. There used to be a time when government support to build programs um, would help students develop skills that were needed to support critical sectors in the economy. And this would in turn help the nation become more innovative and competitive, which would continually drive more corporate R&D. And finally, access to a high quality talent pool that understands the real world application of science, te technology, engineering, and mathematics made the entire industry more innovative, which in turn strengthened the economy and helped to ensure that the entire country continued to become wealthier over time. And finally, the generation of wealth from the private sector could be taxed, which would benefit the government. However, unlike today, where we want... Now, Lego is a company that's done a great job of monopolizing the educational market. And don't get me wrong, Lego is one of my favorite companies, and I highly recommend their products, while also issuing a word of caution about blindly jumping in on technology for all the wrong reasons, which isn't Lego's fault if you do that. Now, this LEGO DACTA controller was released back in the early 1990s, but you may be surprised to know that the original LEGO robotics kits weren't designed for children. They were designed for engineering students at MIT so that they could rapid prototype ideas in the lab. And the first time I used one of these LEGO DACTA controllers was at the Faculty of Engineering at Queen's University. Now, fast forward to present day. We now have LEGO spike kits being sold to schools and droves to support lower year programming programs. Now, this product is great because it has a low point of entry in the sense that you can play with it just like a toy. But there's so much potential in what you could do with it as well. And this toy-like interface and gamification of programming has become the cornerstone of a lot of STEM programs, especially as STEAM pushes further and further into the younger year groups. Now, while programming is important, it has begun to dominate the focus of most STEM programs. And this has been at the expense of all other sectors that are equally as critical to our economy. Now, because LEGO did such a good job simplifying coding while also providing a tactile learning resource, the idea that students could learn logic and abstraction from a young age really took hold in international education. For example, England went on to become the first country in the European Union to mandate computer science classes for all children between the ages of 5 and 16. And if you read through their national curriculum, you'll probably be amazed by the learning statements that are indicated in this document. Now, for anyone who's unfamiliar with the British system, Key Stage 1 is equivalent to Grades 1 and 2 in the United States. Now, this document goes on to state the following. High quality computing education, information and computation, abstraction, logic and algorithms, analyze computational terms. So we're indicating here that children that are only five to seven years old should be able to learn concepts such as abstraction and logic, as well as computational algorithms. That's impressive because my first year university programming course didn't even get into all of this. Therefore, there's a real disconnect here. Another thing that we need to consider is that teachers in primary are not specialists. So you'll have this notion of asking a teacher with limited to no experience in programming being asked to teach advanced concepts in programming, which is incredibly unrealistic. Now, England is not alone, and in 2016, Finland also introduced programming into the national curriculum as well. However, Finland did identify the following in their initial action plan. 
due to the, li uh, the varied skill levels of Finnish teachers in their ability to teach the basics, the Finnish Ministry of Education will re re be relying on private sector corporations in the initial stage. But this is really concerning. They are concerned with the teacher's ability to teach the basics. So when teachers are being asked to teach concepts when they lack the ability to teach the basics, it's only logical that students would go on to develop a flawed perceptional paradigm of what they're learning. And this type of ignorance is having a profound impact on the industry. Now, the appropriate age for teaching programming is widely disputed, and I'm not likely going to win that argument. But one theory that isn't contested in education is Piaget theory of cognitive development. In key stage one and two, we often use what's called uh, physical, pictorial, or abstract, sometimes also referred to as concrete pictorial abstract. But I have an example here to illustrate this concept if you're unfamiliar with it. At this age, students are still developing their perceptual understandings of the world around them. They may be very creative and imaginative, but imagination is not the same as abstract thought. But the key thing here is that students at this stage are developing some level of abstraction as they move from physical to abstract representations in things like number systems. But this is very different than what abstraction means in computer science. Moreover, in grade 2 to 5, students are still using these tactile math blocks that you see here. These are the ones, tens, hundreds, and thousands blocks. While smaller values are used at the lower grades, the math example that I've provided here is more typical of a grade 5 curriculum. But as you can see, the students still wouldn't have learned concepts such as order of operations, algebra, Boolean operations, and logic, which are all key pre pre uh, precursors to learning computer science if we're going to look at concepts such as abstraction, logic, and computational algorithms in an authentic way, which wouldn't start happening until the child becomes a teenager. Therefore, the only way that we can push such advanced concepts into such a young age group is to continually simplify and gamify a complex idea to the point of completely misrepresenting the true nature that the concept uh, holds in the first place. Now, to illustrate the naivety of this decision, I turn to this UK article that was published by eFinancial Careers, How Computer Programming Became the Worst Choice of Career. But if one news article is not enough to illustrate a possible disconnect with our perceptions versus reality in education, Let's look at another economic uh, indicator. Here is a list of all the Fortune 500 companies in England. Now, despite being the first country to introduce a national curriculum that required students to learn computer science and programming, we don't see a single company in artificial intelligence, hardware or computer engineering, or software development. And when we look at critical skills shortages in the United Kingdom, we see that electrical, computer, and software engineering are at the top of the list. And there are also many other sectors listed as well, which I talk about earlier when discussing the different types of careers in STEM at the beginning of this presentation. So let's look at how these critical skill shortages affect the economy. Well, as this report shows, the UK has serious skill shortages in sectors that are critical to the economy, such as engineering. And this has made the United Kingdom dependent on foreign expertise and technologies, specifically in telecommunication infrastructure and network engineering. And due to the current geopolitical situation, many MPs perceive that there's an imminent threat to English, England's national security. Whether or not such a threat really exists is another issue completely, but there's enough of a perception to urge the government to end all contracts with leading telecom giant Huawei. But what does this decision mean for the British consumer? Well, they'll be left for paying for a multi-million dollar network overhaul that will see the delay of 5G services nationwide. In layman's terms, they will pay more money to have an inferior service for several years while they catch up to the rest of the world. And this will have an adverse effect on businesses as they will have to compete using older and slower network technologies while paying more money to access those services in the first place. Therefore, the failure to meet the needs of these critical sectors does have a direct effect on the economy, security, and national sovereignty as well. So how is it that a country that has invested so much time, money, and resources into de developing a national computer science curriculum be lagging so far behind other nations that don't even offer computer courses in their curriculum? Well, remember that story I told you at the very beginning of my presentation? The one where the Fortune 500 company didn't want to hire graduates with relevant degrees because they often had a flawed per operational paradigm? Well, that's what we're seeing here. 
In order to teach programming to all students, regardless of their aptitude or interest in programming, companies needed to resort to the simplification and gamification of programming skills, which has resulted in the true nature of programming being misrepresented to an entire generation of students. So I want to return to this quote from the Finnish Ministry of Education, due to the varied skill levels of Finnish teachers and their ability to teach the basics. The government knows that their teachers do not have the skills needed to teach programming po properly. Therefore, they're going to rely on corporations to create ready-made solutions that would allow the average teacher to be able to teach programming with no prior learning or experience being necessary. So let me show you what one of these solutions looks like in practice. This is a video that I was given by an experienced computer science teacher. As you can see, they just clicked on the insert button and the code magically populated the relevant areas. Now, to a teacher or administrator who knows nothing about programming, it would be easy to walk into this class and be impressed by what's happening. But in all honesty, all we've done is to completely misrepresent the true nature of programming. And that would encourage the wrong students to pursue programming for all the wrong reasons. In reality, what we've done is created a flawed perceptional paradigm of what programming is. And that could be detrimental to the student's future success in the field of computer science. But let me further support this notion with some evidence-based research. So here we have a key takeaway from a research study from the Rochester Institute of Technology. They indicated that teachers face several challenges when presenting the fundamental concepts of programming in the classroom. The research study also found that students who learned programming using a block-based environment had a higher probability of producing syntax errors uh, than in an authentic text-based programming environment. And you can see by this chart, the discrepancy is staggering. Another study from Northwestern University had similar findings. They indicated that students generally found block-based programming to be easier, but the students went on to identify issues of authenticity. Now, when we think about the original mandates of STEM education, which were to create rigorous academic programs to compete in the new economy, the very notion of our instruction methods lacking authenticity seems questionable. Now, please don't get me wrong. Programming is incredibly, incredibly important, but it's also an incredibly difficult subject area to teach well. What I'm implying here is that programming needs to be done by a professional who knows what they're talking about, and it needs to be done at a point where students have the cognitive ability to properly engage with abstract concepts such as logic and computation. Furthermore, we also need to make sure that we're not misrepresenting the true nature of programming either. For instance, the gamification and simplification of programming has created a seriously flaw flawed perception of what programming is all about. So what happens when students don't take programming seriously and their programs are riddled with syntax errors as we saw in the, the research studies? What happens when there's syntax errors in the traffic control light systems, the national power grid, or in a life support system? Or what about these examples of software glitches in the Boeing 737, which resulted in two airplane crashes in less than one year, killing all passengers on board? And I can go on to cite numerous examples from around the world where hundreds of people have died as a result of faulty programming, which really illustrates the point that I'm trying to make here. There's nothing wrong with teaching programming, but it's important that programming is taught by a qualified professional and at a, a point where the learner has developed the necessary cognitive thought processes that are needed to be able to interact with the content in a meaningful way. So if it isn't STEM, then what is it? So let's look at these projects uh, for a moment. The first one is a science diorama. Is it cross-curricular? Does it solve any real-world problems? And more importantly, does it promote innovation? While this project is somewhat cross-curricular in nature, the art is peripheral to developing our understanding of the solar system. Furthermore, this project does not address a legitimate need, but a desire to make a fun and engaging project. Great! That's perfectly valid. However, it's not STEM by definition. This is a prime example of project-based learning, which is an excellent approach to teaching and learning that any teacher could incorporate into their classroom, regardless of the subject that they teach. Next is Lego, which I personally love while also being somewhat critical of its overuse in schools. Now, if we consider Piaget theory of cognitive development, this kind of kinesthetic activity is excellent for the development of concrete operational skills between the ages of 7 and 11 years old. Again, this isn't STEM. This represents play and learn, which is also perfectly valid for, um, as an educational framework 
and it's critical for the cognitive development in children at this age. And finally, the robot. Of course, we all think that this is STEM because the students made a robot. But did they really make a robot? They could have made anything here. A fairy princess, a superhero, or an animal friend. This is just arts and crafts. And this is what's happening now um, that schools are trying to make K-12 through STEM programs without really understanding the true nature of STEM education. Perfectly valid teaching pedagogies are being swallowed up by the STEM craze. But this kind of flawed uh, misrepresentation of STEM only contributes uh, to us moving further and further away from the, our original objectives, which was to create rigorous academic programs that promote real-world applications of science, technology, engineering, and math skills, which would prepare students for the new economy. And that brings me back to my example about coffee at the start of this presentation. People's perceptions are often very different from reality. Now, I'm sure everyone aware is aware of these kinds of memes related to expectations versus reality. So again, I'm going to come back to this notion that STEM was created in response to national studies that were in, uh, indicated that America was falling behind other nations in critical sectors to the economy. While the VTE programs of the 1970s to, uh, to 90s benefited from the collaboration between government industry leaders and educators alike, the STEM movement of the 21st century didn't have a galvanizing catalyst to drive educational reforms. So now, more than 20 years later, with the evolution of STEM into STEAM and the widespread adoption of those programs in most schools, what do the numbers actually look like? Unfortunately, things didn't turn out the way that we wanted. We have missed our mark. Look at America, the nation that was once the leader, the country that invented STEM education to advance scientific and mathematical literacies and yet they're still falling even further behind in these key educational metrics. And why is that? Because teachers were never properly supported in the early days of STEM education, and this has led to confusion and disarray with the development of STEM programs worldwide. And the data speaks for itself. We can see the long-term results clearly if we take the time to take a look. But what about Canada? They're at the top of the list for English-speaking countries. So what are they doing differently than other English-speaking nations? Well, Canada is one of the few nations that has a vocational teacher education program which allows industry professionals to become qualified teachers. But not only is the program track available, it's actually a requirement for teachers that want to teach any of the high-skilled technologies such as electrical, computer, and mechanical engineering. Therefore, these rigorous academic programs are being taught by highly trained professionals. And these professionals have invaluable experience that they can bring to education to help, that help them design authentic real-world lessons that apply science, technology, engineering, and mathematics in an appropriate context. And this will prepare the students for the new global economy. And we can see these keywords uh, that we keep talking about from the original mission of STEM uh, uh, popping up again and again. So far I've talked a lot about ideas that would be germane to educators. However, I haven't spent much time addressing uh, program management, which is something that most school administrators are probably interested in learning more about. Now, the key thing I can recommend here is that you take the time to question your own decisions, to be critical thinkers and delve deeper into your own decision-making process, to constantly evaluate the integrity of your decision-making. Now, this doesn't mean that you should second-guess every decision or that the decisions that you've been making are wrong. What this means is that you need to make sure that you're making decisions based um, that you're not making decisions based on preconceptions that are maintaining the business as usual mindset. Instead, you need to push yourself to make rational decisions that are based on fact. And this is very difficult for us to do as we're not wired this way. We're a species that's governed by our emotions and not logic. And we've seen so far, even the CEOs of some of the world's largest companies still struggle to overcome this challenge. Therefore, leaders need to take a moment for themselves to step back and critically reflect upon their own ideas and to make sure that their actions align with their school's vision and mission statement, which is an idea that's at the heart of what most business schools around the world teach their MBA graduates. However, there's no right or wrong answer here, only a mindset of critically evaluating the very essence of the decisions that we make to ensure that our actions uphold our ideals, vision, and corporate mission statements. Now, remember when I introduced the idea that most people's perceptions of what they think they want compared to what they actually want are being two very disassociated concepts? Well, we see this concept um, is particularly true for parents and administrators regarding STEM education. 
Let me illustrate this point. Here in China, parents want the best for their child. They want a holistic education, and they don't want their child to go through the mass hysteria of an exam-based system such as the Gaokao. But what's the first thing that these parents do after pulling their child out of a rigorous exam-based system? They typically enroll their child in either IGCSE courses, which is just another exam-based system, or they get their child to take as many AP classes as possible, which again is just another exam-based system. And this example really illustrates how parents' perceptions of what they think they want for their children being completely different than what they actually want. They often think that they want a holistic approach to education, but in reality, they just swap one exam-based system for another. And they pay a lot of money for this, so they expect results. Now, the average cost of private education in China now exceeds 20,000 US dollars per year, which is a lot of money. And in Shanghai, that average is over 40,000 a year. And this notion shed some light on the recent policy changes to crack down on the private education sector in China. However, the key takeaway here is that there's a lot of money in private education, and parents want to get their money's worth. Now, because of the expectations, which is phenomenally high, coupled with the cost of tuition and unprecedented level of competition, school administrators want programs that can sell. Therefore, administrators typically want to see highly marketable programs that show inclusive, holistic, and engaging hands-on activities. And as we see in, with some of these examples, we had inclusive um, hands-on activities being done, but many of them were not holistic and they failed to meet the appropriate learning outcomes. Which brings me to another key point. There's a difference between showing and doing. And while it's easy to show people that we're providing STEM programs, it's very hard to do it well. And this brings us to these two different ideologies for STEM education that administrators are constantly grappling with. They often think that they want inclusive programs that are fun and engaging, but they also want to give the parents exactly what they want, which is a rigorous academic program that will improve test scores. However, we often find that these two ideas are incompatible with each other, and this creates a phenomenon that's known as academic culture shock. Now, culture shock always starts with the honeymoon phase, and there's a lot of excitement around launching a new STEM program, and lots of money gets spent. But that's followed by the rejection phase, where schools are expecting to see positive returns on their investment but are often faced with disappointing results that did not meet their expectations. When their multi-million dollar investment turns into this, a bunch of glorified art projects and an unmarketable pile of junk, which th brings us to the regression phase, where school administrators grapple with the idea of what to do next. And one of two things will happen here. Ideally, the re uh, responsible parties will sit down, identify the problem, and develop a strategic action plan that takes into consideration what the school can feasibly do with the resources, while also developing an action plan that's aligned with the school's vision and objectives. Alternatively, emotions come into play, and this often leads to bad financial decisions as we continue to support the mistakes that we've already made. At this point, we get trapped by emotional attachments to bad investments which represent uh, various sunk costs. And this results in decisions that will only result in the program dragging on and, um, and draining financial resources before f eventually going on and failing altogether. And this brings me to a conversation with a teacher who was really distraught with what was happening at their school. They were hired as a STEM and makerspace teacher, but the school had gone s through such an emotional roller coaster that their past with their past implementation strategy that shortly after hiring the teacher, the principals got to the point where they never wanted to hear the word STEM uttered in their school ever again. And that kind of backlash against STEM education is starting to grow as more schools enter the rejection phase due to poorly executed plans. Gr regrettably, these situations seriously impact the future of STEM education and will continue to do so unless we start taking immediate action to solve the phenomenon. So how does this situation come to pass? Well, it starts when school administrators often invest in equipment and facilities to create a need, rather than starting with the development of a curriculum and then making strategic purchases to support the desired learning outcomes of that curriculum. And they do this as they want to get a program up and running as quickly as possible. Generic purchasing guides are typically used in these kinds of situations, but this approach is very naive because these purchasing guides will not take into consideration limiting factors such as the amount of space a school has. The, fi the finances available to run the program, the number of students which can be enrolled, or the expertise of the teacher who will eventually teach the program. Moreover, most of these purchasing guides are published by the very companies that sell the equipment, 
and they don't care about the development of the school's curriculum. They only care about their bottom line, how much they can sell, and how much money they can make selling it. Next, teachers are brought in to teach a program, and they often complain that they don't have the appropriate materials that they, that they need to teach the curriculum. As a result, project development often resorts to the lowest common denominator, which is typically results in the development of glorified arts and crafts projects. And finally, this results in a compromised program development and a growing level of frustration between parents, teachers, and school administrators. Now let's look at some examples of misaligned equipment purchases that have resulted from using Easy Start guides for STEM education. In this example, the school spends thousands of dollars on equipment which they believe represents STEM education. They thought that this would provide an authentic, hands-on learning experience which would support what the parents wanted from a premium education. In this photo, we can see a class set of Singer sewing machines which were incredibly expensive top-of-the-line units. But is this purchase aligned with the development of rigorous academic standards that will help get the child into a top university? After all, this is what parents are typically paying for such a high premium for when they enroll their uh, child into a private educational system. In this example, we can see the school started teaching skills for a general labor market. And this is because they naively thought that hands-on learning is the same thing as STEM education. But this kind of skill set is misaligned with what the parents expect for their child's future. As a result, parents are likely to become displeased that their child is not being given the rigorous academic program that they've paid for. Now, let me put the parents' concerns into context for you. The average wage for a seamstress is $12.94 in the United States, which is just above the poverty line. And in developing countries, it's less than $2 a day. But some private schools are charging more than $40,000 a year for tuition. Therefore, parents that are spending this kind of money on private education are expecting rigorous academic programs that will help get their child into the best universities possible and for their child to go on and get high-paying jobs. They're not typically going to invest thousands of dollars for their child to learn skills for a general labor market unless there's a really good reason for it. And this raises another good point. Not all schools need to focus on getting every student into universities like Harvard, Yale, Princeton, or Oxford. There's a need for schools that serve a niche market. And we see this in some uh, extent with private charter schools in the United States. However, serving a niche market needs to be part of your strategic vision and educational philosophy and not an accidental afterthought. Let me reiterate before moving on that there's nothing wrong with having sewing lessons in school. I myself had to take a mandatory life skill class when I was in school in Japan. In this class, we learned how to drink tea, green tea properly, manage our personal finances, how to cook basic meals, and yes, we learned how to sew as well. But we learned how to sew a button on our shirts or repair a rip seam in our pant leg, and this cost almost nothing as we only needed a simple needle and thread. Moreover, it also had a practical real-world application. But this wasn't by any means called STEM education. It was called life skills, and the skills we learned had uh, uh, were not to prepare us to go onto an unskilled labor market. Instead, these lessons were designed to help us learn practical skills that we would likely use in everyday life regardless of what profession we went into. And China has recently announced changes to their education system um, as well that will see children receive life skill classes as part of their K to, uh, K9 through K, K to 9 public education system. Now the last point I have time to make is regarding value-added service. The key thing here is to, uh, to keep in mind is that something which might be considered a wise decision for one school may not be considered acceptable for other schools. And this is particularly true of public institutions which offer a free education versus private institutions that come at a hefty price tag. Let me give you an example. As we saw with the Minish Ministry of Education, they were concerned about the teacher's ability to teach the basics. Now, if the Finnish government paid for an interactive programming subscription for use in the free public schools, then they've provided a value-added service to the parents. However, if a private school which charges $40,000 does the exact same thing, the parents will probably be outraged. And this is because the parents could have just bought the subscription for themselves for far less than what they are paying for their child to go to that premium school in the first place. Therefore, the private school hasn't provided any value-added service to the parents that would justify the tuition. However, let me provide you with another example to illustrate this idea slightly better. Most of us love the $4 hamburger from our favorite fast food restaurant, and at this price it does provide value for money. However, if we were to take that same hamburger and serve it in a luxurious restaurant, it will still be a $4 hamburger. We haven't added any value to the product or service. 
And this is a real example from a few years ago that drew a lot of attention. However, it by no means is a sustainable business model. And that is one thing that you need to think about when developing specialty programs for your school. Are you creating value for money? Because if you're not, then your business model will not be sustainable for long. Therefore, let me reiterate this point. What's appropriate for a free public school may not be acceptable for an expensive private school. You need to make sure that you're avoid, um, adding value to the products or services that you're offering to, uh, to your clients, as they will expect to get their money's worth. Therefore, you'll need to make complex decisions that go way beyond educational management and into the realms of business management. Only then will you be able to strike a balance that's needed to create strategic business plans that uphold your educational objectives. So let's wrap things up with a series of recommendations. I spent six years doing my MBA, focusing my studies on the development of STEM programs here in China. And part of the reason I spent so long in my master's degree was so I could observe as many schools as possible. This allowed me more time to gather data and validate ideas on, over an extended period of time. Therefore, before we conclude today's pr presentation, I want to share with you a few takeaways from my dissertation. Ironically, a lot of the ideas in, uh, seems co like common sense. However, I'm sure that you're aware that of the saying, common sense isn't all that common at all. Let's start with recommendations that would be implemented by the Ministry of Education. Continue reviewing foreign research on the development of STEM teaching pedagogies while conducting in, uh, internal research studies into the ongoing development of domestic STEM programs. Develop more teacher training programs for local teachers to address immediate teacher shortages. Create VTE or Industries to STEM teacher pathways to address interim teacher shortages. And this is something that we saw happening in Canada. And as the PISA results show, they must be doing something right. Develop concurrent teacher training programs to address long-term demand for highly qualified teacher teaching professionals. Encourage local STEM teachers to conduct and publish research into the ongoing development of STEM programs within their own country, which is actually a requirement for local Chinese teachers. And I think that this is a valuable strategy to ensure continued professional development of the teacher, particularly in developing uh, demanding sectors such as STEM education. Strategically rotate teachers and principals to advance STEM program development. Again, this is a strategy that the Chinese government has put into place to help ensure the development of high quality educational programs nationwide. And finally, to start promoting the development and sharing a STEM curriculum amongst local schools. The next set of recommendations are for administrators. It is important for administrators to work with STEM teachers during the early stage of a program's development. Now, although this sounds obvious, it doesn't happen all that often particularly at private schools as administrators typically start with a mass investment to get the program going before hiring a teacher for the program. Promote a unified school-wide understanding of STEM education while also emphasizing the future role STEM has in the school's long-term educational strategy. And while this is incredibly important, it hardly ever happens in practice. Offer brief in-service programs to provide accurate information about STEM programs to help dispel any misconceptions that may form otherwise. And again, reaching out to um, community partners can have a huge impact on teaching and learning. However, we don't see this happening much anymore, which is very unfortunate because we saw the benefits of collaboration um, that the VTE programs in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s had. Learn from the school's STEM teacher and try reaching out to local community partners, which could offer additional guidance and insight. And finally, try sharing best practices with other schools via curriculum sharing, publishing of research, um, or through teacher and principal rotation programs. And this is something that the Ministry of Education in China is trying to encourage through the introduction of its new educational policies. However, it can be very difficult to encourage private schools to collaborate with one another as they're often in direct competition. Next are recommendations for purchasing departments. Avoid making uninformed purchasing decisions. Again, this seems incredibly obvious, but most purchasing decisions are made by finance departments that do not understand the details of the purchase that they're making. And this often uh, leads to a lot of bad purchasing decisions or substitutions being made. Work with STEM teachers to make relevant equipment purchases. Make purchases that support strategic learning outcomes. And as we saw, many schools rely on easy start guides to build their programs, which only results in buying equipment and then trying to make a need for it. However, quality programs start by developing the desired learning outcomes, and then we'll look at ways of making strategic purchases to support the desired learning outcomes of that program. Look at making complementary uh, equipment purchases. Work with teachers and IT departments to avoid compatibility issues, or develop support strategies to aid in the successful implementation of the new technologies. 
as compatibility issues are some of the biggest issues that I see on a regular basis. Now, part of this results from uninformed purchasing decisions being made by the school, but let me give you an example. Many schools are implementing a one-to-one -one or bring-your-own device a program for students, and these programs are often centered around school-wide use of Apple computers. However, equipment is purchased for the school STEM program that's only compatible with Windows computers. Again, it seems obvious, and yet it's happening at most of the schools that I've seen over the past 10 years. And finally, avoid buying uh, into proprietary equipment architectures, or if this kind of investment is necessary, invest heavily into one system architecture and avoid unnecessary uh, diversification into similar yet incompatible ecosystems. And the last section is about recommendations uh, that teachers can use. Work with the school administrator to develop an educational plan for STEM programs that develop uh, and focus on educational expectations while also supporting the teacher's needs. Determine the number of courses being offered, how many sections of each course will be run, and how many students can safely or viably attend each class section. Determine what equipment will be needed to offer the proposed program and compare this with the funds available for the equipment and uh, material purchases. Identify if an asynchronous learning approach is needed to maximize the use of equipment purchases or if a program with a fixed chronological order will provide better learning outcomes. Set key learning objectives for the course and make strategic purchasing decisions that support those learning outcomes. Spread out purchases over the course of several years while constantly reassessing the curriculum objectives and then adjust purchasing decisions accordingly. Make additional purchases that complement the pre-existing purchase purchasing strategy um, and to strengthen the learning outcomes of the existing program. Well, that's a lot of information, but that brings us to the end of our presentation. Is there still a future in STEM and what we can do to fix the problem? I hope that you've enjoyed uh, what we've done, covered today and that you've learned a lot from this presentation. And I also hope that you'll enjoy all the hands-on activities that we have planned for you throughout the rest of the symposium.